Ouais, c'est ça, c'est le gros bouton. Il n'y euh, a pas de gros bouton. Ça marche tout à l'heure. Oui, ouais, c'est bien ça. Ah. Dame. Il n'y a plus okay. de piles. Il n'y a plus de piles déjà. <rire> ok. Euh. Ah, 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 voilà. Je vais te donner un autre affaire. Ok, pour les 12 minutes, je te fais le signe à 5 et 2. Ok. Uh, okay, so I will speak of uh, you know, strong lensing in several surveys, DES, Cephis unions, Euclid, although we don't have data yet. That's a provocative uh, picture of what can be uh, um, uh, data augmentation. You know, we never, at least we, never understand really how this works, what the effects on the, on the data, we still do it. Uh, why horseshoe is here? Because this is the horseshoe uh, lens. So that's what work carried out with several people that I will present. Uh, and the goal of this work is not really to get you know, some more lenses, although you know, it's nice to get more lenses and do science with them, study dark matter, do time delay cosmography, for example, but what we want re here is really uh, real data as a test bench uh, for Euclid. So how we, we design the uh, lens finders uh, in the Euclid satellite. Uh, so one big challenge is the diversity of lenses. How do we pre-select galaxies? Do we want to test all objects in surveys or a pre-selection of them? Uh, do we want to privilege color over resolution? Different surveys have different characteristics. Uh, we also want to build catalogs of contaminants. I will show you what they are in the case of lenses. We want to find a large number of lenses to enable follow-up already and do science with them and to test modeling tools, deblending tools. You know, by definition, where you have a lens, things are blended. You have the lens plane, the source plane, and you want to deblend this to study your, your lenses. And eventually, what we go towards is, is probably uh, tra uh, machine learning training sets that will be completely data-driven uh, for Euclid uh, eventually. Um, OK. So just to illustrate the diversity of lenses, uh, so we have, no, NL is non-lens, L is lens in this, and you have many, many different possible uh, character, uh, configurations. You have, you know, you, when you start doing CNNs, you pre-select galaxies and you choose a stamp size, which is already a problem. So for example, here you have a non-lens, two non-lenses, here a lens, so the blue things are the lensed stuff. But this can be discovered as four lenses by a CNN, or you can even discover uh, a, a lens with a lens source next to a non-lens, and then this may be mistaken as a lens. You may select an Einstein ring, but with a too short stamp, or you may select several times the same one. Now, this is at the galaxy scale. When you increase the size, things become more complex, and there it's a mess. So you could consider the whole thing here as a lens, you know, a group, or you can consider this as a lens and these two as a non-lens and so on, and the problem is getting more and more complicated. So in the end, the, big, the real problem there is what is a lens uh, and, what, and at what scale uh, do we want it? And then comes cluster, of course, and that is a real mess because you have uh, um, arcs formed by, by different uh, arcs formed by, by different sources at different redshifts, and all this is mixed. And you also want to associate different arcs which come from the same source. So it's, in the end, quite a complex system. So we test this in uh, DES and Cephis. Uh, in DES, we have access to colors. In, uh, we don't have access to colors in Cephis, only the R band. But we go for, uh, we have higher resolution images. Uh, what we have here is color and no information on redshift and velocity dispersions. In Cephis, we do a search where we target galaxies, so LRGs essentially, that have information on redshift and velocity dispersion. So they're you know, quite different samples, and in the end you will see that we find more or less the same number of lenses, although they are different because of the reasons uh, I mentioned before. Okay, so that's uh, how we do. Uh, so we do CNNs, we need simulations, and we go for the data-driven approach. So we take essentially LRG galaxies here that are not lenses. We paint lensing behind these lenses in DES in three bands, in Cephis in only one band. 
You have different numbers of simulations, also for technical reasons. Uh, the ancient radii we sample are different here and here because the seeing is better in CFEs than in uh, DES. Uh, and we train on lenses, which are half data driven, half is painted on, on, the, on the stamps, and non lenses here. So for the source galaxies, we take galaxies from Cosmos to which we allocate K corrections and colors from the HSC Subaru survey. So then you run, okay, the machine learning stuff and you find lots of garbage, of course, uh, plus real lenses. And we sort our galaxies in different categories. So mergers, these are found by, by, the, uh, by the network, spiral galaxies, ring galaxies, Flexion is a category where we have some marquee thing next to a galaxy, but not super convincing. And maybe lens is something that looks like a lens, but that may need, uh, let's say, further data, either in imaging or spectroscopy, to be confirmed. Okay, so that's in the end what we get, and we visually inspect all these. So that's in the S76,000 objects, 10,000 objects more or less in, uh, in CEPHIS. Uh, the whole thing took about a week to inspect, you know, seven of us inspecting all this. That's our heat map, because we do, so heat map of what, I will tell you. Uh, so to, we do the classification in two steps. We have a mosaic of 10 by 10 galaxies in the first step, where we quickly cl click on what can be a lens uh, or not. And then we do, in a second step, a detailed classification, where we classify things as sure lens, maybe lens, Flexion, ring, spiral, mergers, that's the object I showed you before. Uh, this is so a check of you know, if there is any bias when we visually inspect in our mosaic of 10 by 10. So if you have you know, similar numbers here everywhere, it means that you click as many times on a galaxy in, 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 as, as any other in any place on the, on the mosaic. So it means you, know, you click, you click 1.1 times here on average, it's normalized. One, one time here, but there is no, for example, gradient that you get, the user is getting more tired when, when going through the mosaic. And that's the standard deviation of it. Okay, then agreement between the, uh, the different, uh, okay, the different um, users. So I told you we have sure lens, maybe lens, flexion, and non-lens. Uh, now this is, our six users classifying things, that's the number of either maybe lens or sure lens they find, or they consider uh, they find, so after the CNN classification. So you see, first, these numbers are very different, and then you know, the users don't really agree. And that's in spite of a you know, predefined classification scheme and a training session between the six different users. So that's, a, you know, not an easy step to do this human classification. Um, then comes the problem of deep blending. Uh, so we saw some of it in the previous uh, talks. Uh, if you have colors and if you don't have colors, you do, don't do this in the same way. If you have colors, we go for a multiband uh, morphospectral component analysis decomposition. So essentially you consider that your data is the sum of a red channel and a blue channel each decomposed on, uh, um, uh, on wavelets and regularized, of course. So if you do this in DES, that's the kind of thing you get. That's the, the original lenses we find after the visual classification step. Uh, that's the lens plane, essentially red, and the source plane, essentially uh, blue. So there is no model fitting involved here. There is no machine learning neither. Uh, this is uh, sparse regularization of wavelets and, and, um, and uh, spectral decomposition. Now, if you don't have color, like in Euclid, uh, at least you don't have color at the same kind of resolution, uh, you can use uh, autoencoders. So that's what we did here. And we essentially use mapping between the inputs and the labels to do that. So you, you train autoencoders with you know, showing, the, uh, showing simulated lenses and showing just galaxies. And then since you uh, uh, linked the inputs and the label, you can in an image tell what is compatible with the galaxy, what is compatible with the lens source. And that's what we get. So again, that's our lenses. That's the decomposition using the autoencoders. So you know, we would need more, more, more training, maybe a different light and space, but you know, essentially 
we show there that we can sort it out when the Euclid data come. Um, Okay, quick word about Euclid. So what do we expect? So Euclid will observe 32 by 32 arc minutes uh, field of view. It will observe 50,000 tiles of this size. Uh, and to the Euclid depth, uh, well, if we cut at 22 in the Vs band, we'll have to test 1,000 objects per tile. Uh, we expect a total of 200,000 lenses. That's theoretical predictions of how many lenses there should be on the sky, uh, galaxy scale. And that means three lenses per tile. Euclid will observe 20 tiles per day, so we should have 60 lenses per day. Uh, that should be tested among 20,000 objects. Now, the, what we did in CEPHIS and DES show that we have about 0.5% false positive rate, uh, rate, which looks nice, given that it's real data, not simulations. That means we need to inspect per day 100, uh, 100 candidates. So is it feasible or not? Maybe down to this depth, maybe not if we go a bit fainter. Okay, so summary. So I didn't say the numbers of lenses we, we found. Actually, it's not the, what is really, really important, but we find you know, 500, 500, uh, 400 sorry, lenses in the ES. It's only the R1, by the way. Uh, 133 lenses in CEFIs. It's only half of the uh, sky coverage of CEFIs. Uh, but out of many different, uh, out of very different numbers of objects as pre-selection. So here it's 18 million, 2.3 million here. And they are selected in very different ways. So it's super hard to compare. Actually, getting the selection function for these lens finding algorithm will be uh, very hard, maybe even impossible. Um, so overall numbers of lenses we find is compatible with what others have done. But in other searches, you know, people have found clusters or lensing by uh, groups, for example. Uh, and they always find the same type of numbers, which doesn't mean any of these is correct, because the lenses are, are, are very different in the first place. Uh, what we see also is that the quality of the training in the end prevails over the quality of the network. You know, you can tweak your network as you want. It will have much less effect than changing the training set. No, no big surprise there, but it applies to lensing as well. Color information seems less imp important than high resolution. So we find better lenses, maybe not more, but better in terms of visual confirmation in CEPHIS than in DES, which is good news for Euclid, because that's what Euclid will have, high resolution. Um, so in Euclid, what we'll do is probably pre-select everything down to some limiting magnitude, and we don't care about colors. We may have too many uh, false positives for now, so that's a step to improve. So if we want to improve something in, in, uh, in machine learning in, in this area is, is really the number of false positives. You may want to miss a few more lenses, but have a, a higher pur purity in your sample. Um, and what we ultimately want with Euclid is after one year of data acquisition, have a sample enough real lenses to train on those lenses and remove completely the, the simulation aspects. And then we have to also probably implement citizen science to clean from the false positives. Um, I didn't speak of the modeling. You know, modeling, you know, there will be talks about the modeling with machine learning. Without machine learning, it takes about two hours per, per lens to, do, to fit a simple lens model with a full MCMC. So it's also feasible, um, you know, with or without uh, machine learning. Okay, thank you. Thanks, okay, so there is a, two questions on the Slack. Uh, the first one from Helena Dominguez-Sanchez. Uh, what's the completeness on selecting a score greater than 0.9 in DES? The completeness, well, the completeness on simulation is, is, is very high, actually. What was it? Um, completeness should be like 80%. Okay. Um, but evaluated on the validation set. Of course, on the real sky, I don't know. <laughs> and there's another question from Stefan Hextin. Uh, do you use the input of human visual inspection to train the classifier further in order to reduce the number of false positives? Try say again? Yeah. Without the mask. the mask, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you use the input of human visual inspection to train the classifier further in order to reduce the number of false positives? No, so far, no. But, but uh, as I was saying, there will, we also built um, samples of contaminants. 
so rings, spirals, and so on. So actually, at the beginning, we wanted to train against ring galaxies, but they are not enough. So now we are thinking of doing GANs to increase the number of rings we find. Now, next question for machine learners is, can we train on samples that have been generated in the first place with GANs? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so say your name first uh, before you ask your question. Uh, Karen Henneke, hi. You're the next speaker. No. <laughs> yeah. um, so in relation to the last question, maybe quickly, um, have you thought of trying as, like, let's say, user number seven for the classification? Yes, yes. Have Sorry, you, but oh, the remove that. <laughs> so have you tried to um, use something like unsupervised, like a, I don't know, self-organizing map or something no, like so, that? No, so far no. Actually, after we, we submitted this, this paper, well, the first one, the second is not submitted about uh, CEFIS. There was this other paper by actually someone who will give a talk uh, these days about um, self-supervised uh, networks. And it looks great, but we didn't try it so far. That would be fantastic because then we can use the real lenses of Euclid and show no, a few real lenses from Euclid and immediately the thing is supposed to you know, give you a bunch of other real lenses. But we didn't do it so far. Okay. Yeah. Okay, one last question for Rania. Hi, Rania Pires. Um, so it's again about the selection function. Um, what are the prospects for actually learning that for the real data, not on simulations? Because it could bias the cosmology if you don't know it. Right? Well, th that really depends on, so I agree, no, it would be really needed. But I'm quite pessimistic of what we can do because, you know, you can simulate things, of course, but even, the, ev even you know, the predictions by, by Tom Collette here, for example, uh, of the number of lenses is, is purely theoretical. So that can be wrong in the first place, and that would be the best truth you can consider. So if this is wrong, and it's wrong for sure, uh, not because of Tom, but because of you know, theories often wrong, uh, then you can't evaluate the, the selection function. What you may do is to evaluate the relative selection function by beans of you know, redshift, magnitudes, things like this, but I fear that we'll have to evaluate the selection function you know, given a, a, a given scientific topic. So if you count lenses or if you want to be sure that you have all lenses of a given Einstein radius, for example, you, you don't do the same thing in terms of evaluating the selection function. So the answer is, no, it will be very hard, and it really depends on the specific science goal you want with, with these lenses. Thanks very much for the nice okay. talk. Okay, thanks very much again, Fred. So let's go to the last talk.